Okay, I, um, I, I would like to go over a little bit of uh, some of the disparities that occur in uh, cancer care. And it's not only cultural, um, and it's not only language, uh, at least not foreign language, but it's, it's the language that we speak and the level that we speak it at and we understand, at the level that we understand it. Uh, do you know that I found out that there are 28% of Americans in 2011 that, have, uh, that are college graduates? I, I would have thought that number was much higher. And so we could have a very sophisticated patients with a high IQ and, and uh, high levels of education and training, but when they get into a physician's office, all bets are off. Um, and that's where um, health literacy, medical literacy comes in. So I have uh, prepared, I hope, a very um, interesting and entertaining talk. Um, I grabbed this um, from one of the medical, medical oncologist's office. It's, um, do you know this? Three legs, blind in one eye, missing right ear, tail broken, recently castrated answers to the name of Lucky. Um, you can always find some hope in every situation, and I think that is really important um, because I say whenever you have a negative visit, you always have to find something positive. Um, and that's very, very true. There's always something good. There's a, a, a new grandkid. There's, um, uh, you know, there's ways also to cope and prepare. And I say that before you go to a visit, go to the movies the night before. Go out and have dinner with some friends. Okay. So can we talk? How to communicate with your healthcare team? I am going to talk about medical literacy a little bit, about decision making, because that's really where it's at. And finally, when you come to someone's office, why it always seems to be such a barrier to get that information. Okay, um, enhancing physician-patient communication. This is, um, this is my oldest patient. She was 106 when she died of pancreatic cancer. I diagnosed her when she was 92 with breast cancer. And every year that I saw her, she said, I am not coming back. She even came once with her son, who I thought was her husband. He was, he, I think he looked older than she did, but she was always a lady and she was always, um, and she was always very, um, very aware of her health. Uh, but she was a sad woman towards the end because of, um, you know, losing a lot of her friends, 106 years old. Uh, but she did teach me a lot about relationships. Communication problems are relationship problems, but communication problems are also related to health literacy. Uh, so this is the, the model that Lee was talking about, that paternalistic model where <clears throat> we held ourselves up on pedestals. Those were the good old days. No, I'm just kidding. I'm only kidding, kidding, kidding. Okay. This is where physicians made the decisions for you. Um, and now there's also the consumerism model where the patients make the decisions totally themselves. They come in, they let you know what they want, they give you articles from the internet, which doesn't always pertain to them. Um, but that, you know, the, the left and the right hand side are, are not really good models. It's the middle model of that, um, that dialogue. It's that dialogue between a patient and a doctor. It's collaborative, it helps you uh, get at what the best decision for you is. Um, and that means getting the information uh, not, not too much, too soon, and not too little, too late, because that's not good either. Um, so you have to have a balance, and you have to have a balanced discussion, and you have to have some evidence. And that's where we're at now, which is evidence-based medicine. And Dr. Spire talks about that all the time. The recommendation should be based on what we know scientifically, what we can prove, and there is a lot of information out there now. This is a wonderful, wonderful website called kingsfund.org.uk. So if you have the opportunity to go on it, um, it, is in, uh, a, a, it is an organization based in Britain. Um, there was a section in their guide, guidebook called No Decisions About Me Without Me. Um, and it does talk about that decision making, um, and, and here is just an example of 
what my experience may be and what your experience may be. I know the diagnosis. You can experience the illness. I know sometimes the etiology of your symptoms and you know the social circumstances. I may know your prognosis, um, but you may have a different version of, of overestimating your risk. A lot of people overestimate their risk. Um, I can give you your treatment options, um, but if you don't value those options, you are not going to embrace it. And the outcome probabilities, well, I can give you that, but you are in the end are going to have to decide um, what your preference is. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so for instance, if I tell you um, that your risk is 20% higher um, than someone else's risk of developing colon cancer, and say your risk is about 1 in 1,000 in the general population, and your risk is 20% higher, that risk becomes 1 in 800. So that 20% may be very high to you, but in the scheme of things, it's actually lower. And take, for instance, women who have um, a first-degree relative of breast cancer. They overestimate their risk. Even if they have an inherited form of breast cancer, their risk could not be more than 50%. So it's, um, it's also important that it, it depends on what kind of risks you're given. There's absolute risks. There's relative risks. Uh, if I tell you you should take tamoxifen because it'll lower your risk by 50%, the absolute risk reduction is probably on the order of 2 to 3 percent. So risk is a very risky business to talk about. It's true. Yes. Yes, the patient. And the doctor may not be able to communicate the risks in a way that the patient could make that balanced decision for themselves. So helping patients make better personal health decisions is about understanding the options, and that comes back to medical literacy. This is a definition by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's the degree to which individuals can obtain, process, understand, and use health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. Um, these are some facts. I know it's busy, but just a few things that are really interesting. 36% of adults have basic or below basic skills for dealing with health material. Half of Medicare and Medicaid recipients read below a fifth grade reading level. Uh, more than half of adults have intermediate skills. They could figure out what time a medication should be taken if the label says take two hours after eating, but many do not know what it means to take a medication on an empty stomach. Two-thirds of American adults age 60 and over have inadequate and marginal literacy skills, and 81% of patients age 60 and older at a public hospital could not read or understand basic materials such as prescription labels. You find that interesting. And studies show that patients, now here's, the, here's really important, that patients forget up to 80% of what their doctor tells them as soon as they leave, and nearly half of them don't remember, or who remember, remember incorrectly what was told to them. And so that's why I'm going to talk about what talk back and teach and, and teachable moments are. Uh, then, uh, yeah, so that I talked about this. And so nowadays, when patients are expected to manage multiple chronic illnesses, uh, comply with drug regimens that have grown increasingly complicated, asked to operate sophisticated medical devices such as home monitor equipment, infusions. How do you do that? How do you understand if you can't read? You know, many patients will say, I didn't bring my glasses because a lot of them can't read. Or they'll say to uh, their, their uh, family member, fill that form out for me. I can't look at that. I can't read it because it's complicated and people don't understand it. You know how hard it is sometimes filling out those insurance forms? You know. Um, so how can it affect health outcomes, health literacy? Now this is a really interesting study. It was a study done in, in Colorado at Kaiser Permanente and it looked at people who had, health fail had heart failure who were managed as an outpatient. 
Okay, so there were close to 2,200 patients. 72% responded to three simple questions. Here are the questions. How often do you have someone help you read hospital materials? How often do you have problems learning about your medical condition because of difficulty reading hospital materials? And how confident are you filling out forms by yourself? These are the three questions that evaluated their health literacy. And what they found was that people who had a poor health literacy had higher rates of being admitted to the hospital, they had lower survival, and they had more complications. So how does this impact patients who are diagnosed with cancer? Well, poor health literacy impacts their ability to process and understand the information to make appropriate health care decisions. For instance, okay, now let's go down the list. So what are, we, what are we concerned about in cancer? We're concerned about our risk for developing cancer, trying to prevent it, screening for cancer, diagnosing, treating it, uh, surveying it, and then how to maintain yourself as a permanent survivor. So, you know, people who were not sexually active, for instance, felt that they should not be screened for cervical cancer. People who were postmenopausal did not feel that they were at risk. People who felt that they looked good and felt good, they were not at risk for cancer. So there's a trickle-down effect. People have to understand that getting a mammogram does not decrease your risk of getting breast cancer. It decreases your risk from dying of breast cancer, and the failure to do so may represent a missed opportunity. Okay? Um, for instance, diagnosis. We know that people who read at a lower grade level have more advanced prostate cancers. They looked at African American men and they found that, but when they uh, controlled for race, there was no difference. The difference came from their health literacy. Treatment. There is decreased compliance with treatment because people don't understand what the treatment options are and they don't know when to come back for tests and they miss appointments because they don't understand read, about reading the slips sometimes. I know it sounds, for you, a lot of the people here are very sophisticated and they've had a higher grade education level, um, but there, you know, there are problems with missed appointments. Uh, medical ease. Diet means food. It doesn't mean going on a diet. Exercise can mean walking. It doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym and lift weights. Alcohol, Drinking alcohol in moderation, if you don't drink, you shouldn't start. I know, that was kind of silly. Okay, um, so let's take these two examples here. One is my speaking to a patient um, in medical ease, and the other is my speaking to patients like in their living room. You have a lesion in your mediastine, and Ms. Mr. S, that is two centimeters. We need to perform a fine needle aspiration in order to rule out metastatic adenocarcinoma to a lymph node. But I'm going to sit down with Mr. S and I'm going to talk to him like I would a friend who doesn't really understand a lot about health and about medical issues and cancer. You have a small lump inside your chest. The best way to figure out what it is is to stick a small needle in it. And it's important to do this so we can know how to give you the best treatment. So that sounds better, doesn't it? You know, um, and this is very interesting, when Rudy Giuliani got diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, when they came and they said to him, when they came, the doctor came in and said, your, your biopsy is positive. Rudy thought that was good. He thought that meant he didn't have cancer. And he talks about it. A tumor does not necessarily mean cancer. A mass doesn't necessarily mean cancer. Oh, and, and here, this is a very, very, this is, so Norman Cousins used to be the editor of the Saturday Evening Post. And he said, the more serious the illness, the more important it is for you to fight back, mobilizing all your resources, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and physical. Um, and I think that he really hits it on the head. But with all the sophisticated treatments that we have, it's very confusing these days to keep track of your health. So you really want a doctor who gets it, a doctor who gets the point. Okay, and you know, um, that's where you have to mobilize all your senses. And communication is really important. I saw a patient th 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 tonight before I came here, and she, and she had had a history of breast cancer, and she said to me, I really have a lot of pain. And I said, okay, well, may, you know, 
it's not relieved by anything and I can hardly sit up. And I, I said, well, maybe we should talk to your medical oncologist. And she said, well, you know, I, and then after all of this was finished, she said, you know, I fell in the bathtub and after that I couldn't get up. And I was thinking, well, did I not hear this? Maybe I didn't hear it. Maybe I didn't hear it. Or maybe she didn't say it. And as Lee said, you always talk about what's important up front. First three points are the most important points. So the visit, um, and I'm going to be finished shortly. Under normal circumstances, patients remember only 40 to 6% of the information they have been given in a physician visit. So how do you get the most out of your visit? Um, well, so for us, these are like interesting tips that came out of one of our journals. These are seven tips to bridge the cancer communication gap. Slow down. Limit the key information to three to five points. You just can't absorb more, more. Use living room language, what I just showed you. Demonstrate information using, uh, using props. I, I love to use props. Uh, summarize key points about what's going to happen next and, and what you need and why you're going to order a test. Explain that. Confirm using the teach back method. For instance, when I, when I go to do surgery, I usually speak to the patient in the office. But when I'm doing a complicated surgery, not just a breast excision, I'll sit down and I'll say, what, in your own words, what am I doing? And sometimes they kind of don't get the whole thing, and I have to say, this is what I'm doing. Is this what you understand? Can you, re can you repeat that back to me? Um, be honest, positive, encouraging, and empowering. And I, I think that this is really important, because um, we're all going to be there. <laughs> we're going to all be patients. So how do you prepare for a consultation, what to ask, what to bring? In my office, I always say, bring a sleeping bag, canteen, and war and peace. <laughs> Only kidding. OK. Uh, well, you have to bring the original films, the disc, the scans. You want to bring written reports. Now, written reports, preferably at our cancer center, we like to see two to three years' worth so we can see if there's any change. Glass slides really mean glass slides. So if you've had a biopsy, you want to bring the glass slides so the pathologist can actually put it under a microscope. Uh, referrals if you need them. You want to bring any doctor's addresses, a pad, a pen, tape recorder. But tell the doctor if you're going to, do, um, if you're going to record them. Um, the other day, I had someone who took their BlackBerry out and was recording me. And I said, what are you doing? They said, oh, I'm recording you. I said, no, you have to ask my permission to do that. You know, I put lipstick on. Um, another pair of ears, a good book, like a Kindle, a Nook, an iPad, an iPod. I used to have a Walkman, but that kind of got old. Um, this, is, uh, this is also very interesting. It's a website. I belong to the PLWC, People Living with Cancer website, which is the consumer, um, at, it's the consumer wing of the American Society of Cancer. Um, of, uh, I'm sorry, it's the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. And what we do is we... Um, we look at all different cancers, so it's uh, plwc.org. I just couldn't get the whole website on here, but it's a really nice website. And if you look down, um, I took out the colorectal cancer one, so it says colorectal cancer.net guide. But you look down, it's an overview, it's statistics, um, it's risk factors. But you go all the way down, and it's questions to ask the doctor. And they go through, it, it's not colorectal cancer only, it's neuroendocrine cancers of the pancreas. It's prostate cancer, it's thyroid cancer, it's all cancers. And it tells you when it's updated. And I do the section for the breast with a number of other people. Um, but these are all, these are very, very good website. Um, here's another website that talks about the questions to ask. This is a breast website called Cancer 101. Um, just a word about bringing family members. Uh, you know, it's, it's good to involve family members. It's really bad to have a whole discussion and then say, oh, you know, my husband is outside. Can he come in and hear this again? No. You want to really do this up front. And you also want to know a list of people that you can and can't talk to. Um, that's, I think, really important. So to end with, people, you know, ask me, how do I know you're the doctor? How do I know you're the one? Um, and you know, there are many great doctors in the city. Um, so here's my advice. Um, when do you need a new doc is when your breast surgeon has finished the operation wearing only one earring. <laughs> a new doc when your medical oncologist rushes in late to your appointment still wearing his Burger King uniform. 
A new doc, when your radiation therapist tattoos our skull and crossbones. Mm. A new doc, when your gynecologist orders a booby trap. No. And a new doc, when she walks in wearing a t-shirt that reads, I survived spring break, spring break 2005. So with that, I would like to thank you for coming, and I'm going to.